<clears throat> All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Uh, what I do is referred to as functional neurology, and today we're talking about the brain MRI for concussions. So today is a, a really interesting broadcast. I have a lot of articles to go through, and so I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, let me know, and we'll go from there. So let me go to the presentation. Again, Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist and chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Okay, so the brain MRI for concussion patients. So this is what a standard brain MRI looks like. You see the gray matter. Here's a white matter tract called the corpus callosum. The standard brain MRI is something that's looking for tumors and strokes. It also looks for brain bleeds, particularly in the head injury patients. And so if you've had a head injury and you go to the emergency room, most typically you're going to get a CT scan. That's the preferred modality of choice, so to speak, in the acute period. And they're going to look to see, do you have a bleed or not? That's basically what they're doing. Now, insurance companies are trying to constrain that a little bit because insurance companies have the proclivity of trying to deem what is absolutely medically necessary. And so they're trying to evaluate blood tests to see, okay, if you have an elevated marker of a brain tissue in your blood, maybe that indicates that you should get a CT scan versus not. So a lot of that research is going on right now. But the standard practice at this point in time is that if you have a head injury, you're probably gonna to go to the emergency room, particularly if it's severe, and you're gonna get a CT scan. So, if your CT is normal and then your symptoms persist, then lots of times people get an MRI. Or if you didn't get a CT, and then let's say a week to two weeks later, you go to your GP and say, hey, I had a head injury, I'm still nauseous, I'm fatigued, I can't think how I used to, then they'll say, okay, well, let's send you in for an MRI. And this is what your MRI may look like. There's not gonna be anything massively wrong that they see, and so this is where it comes about that we have the quote unquote invisible injury. So you had an injury, you know something's wrong, but you look normal, your MRI scan is normal. So you as the lay person who doesn't, you know, you're not completely abreast of all the literature on this topic, you're gonna think, well, gosh, I'm normal. And your spouse and your loved ones and your family and your friends are gonna say, well, your brain imaging is normal. Why aren't you feeling normal yet? And they may tell you, well, it may take a little more time. Well. Brain MRI here versus this. This looks dramatically different. This is an image of diffusion tensor imaging of the corpus callosum. So what is diffusion tensor imaging? Diffusion tensor imaging is part of a brain MRI examination. A lot of clinics still do not have this. A lot of imaging clinics still do not have this. Some imaging clinics do have this. Um, so diffusion tensor imaging looks at the white matter tracks, so to speak. So going up, this type of brain MRI does look at white matter tracks, but it looks at the gray matter. We've all heard of gray matter. Well, here's gray matter up here. And gray matter is intermixed with white matter, but the diffusion tensor imaging particularly looks at the white matter microstructural array. So your white matter, we can zero in on it and we can see, oh, we can zero in on different what are referred to as axons. Axons simply are like the wires of our nerves. You have brain cells up here, and then you're gonna have axons that run deep down through the brain and then go down to the brain stem or may go down your spinal cord to help you move your hands or your feet, so on and so forth. So diffusion tensor imaging looks at the white matter. And that's super important because once researchers started doing this, they found that we're seeing abnormalities in concussed patients or post-concussion syndrome patients relative to you know this type of brain Im imaging so that is significant so here we have the association between persistent white matter abnormalities and repeat injury after sport related concussion so here they looked at 
And this is another really important topic because now we're trying to figure out, okay, have you had a concussion? Can we document that? Basically, the literature literature at this point is is very solid in that diffusion sensor imaging can see changes in the microstructure of someone's brain after a head injury. But even maybe more important than that, now we have the question of, okay, someone has post-concussion syndrome, because not everybody who has brain injuries develops post-concussion syndrome. The estimates vary widely as to who has post-concussion syndrome and who doesn't. By that, I mean some estimates say 93% of people who have head injuries are going to recover afterwards. Whereas other estimates say 50% of people after head injuries after a year still have symptoms. So that's really significant. And I want to make sure I go to Facebook and make sure everybody's hearing me. And I think I probably should have minimized this volume. But okay, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to continue on with the presentation. Okay. So, okay, so that question of who still has symptoms, like I said, 50% may have symptoms after a year. And then there's the question of, okay, little Jimmy or, you know, Scott or wh whatever name you want to pick, Brandon, Randall, whomever, has a head injury, and we need to figure out, is that individual safe to go back to playing their beloved sport? And so from that, we have all these sports concussion assessment tools and these different metrics, uh, neuropsychological testing to say, okay, can this individual think like they used to, the impact test, and if they've recovered to the point of pre-injury, so to speak, or they're relatively normal and they're not having symptoms, then we're going to release them back to play. However, is that taking into account the actual microstructure of the brain? And that's what diffusion tensor imaging is allowing us to evaluate. And the answer is probably we need to be looking at diffusion tensor imaging before we let individuals go back to their beloved sport. So here I'll just kind of read through my highlighted uh, version of this. And I always smile because I highlight everything. That's just my tendency. But a recent systematic review determined that the physiologic effects of concussion may persist beyond clinical recovery. So meaning you feel fine, but there's still stuff wrong in your brain. Why is this important? Because now we have this entity referred to as chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which really gained a lot of traction around the year 2002. And I'm sure many of you have seen the movie Concussion. And so now we have individuals who have been exposed to multiple maybe sub-concussive head impacts. Maybe they didn't have concussions, but they had these sub-concussive head impacts, repetitive head injuries, and they're developing neurological and psychiatric symptoms many years later. So were they having damage to their brain that was then getting repeatedly damaged and then not fully recovering? And that is a big concern for a lot of parents. So here they're saying... A recent systematic review determined that the physiologic effects of concussion may persist beyond clinical recovery. And they talk about increased vulnerability that is associated with risk for subsequent more severe injury. The study basically looked at diffusion tensor imaging. They took 82 concussed athletes versus 69 you know, normal controls. And they basically were looking at them right after the injury, seven days post-return to play, six months afterwards. And they found that 11 of the 82 concussed athletes sustained a second concussion within 12 months of initial injury. That's always a concern because once you have, start having more concussions, you're more likely to have more concussions. And the effects can start to amplify. And they basically showed that this is called mean diffusivity. You don't need to know what that is, but it's an abnormal diffusion tensor imaging marker at seven days post return to play was significantly higher in those athletes who went on to sustain a repeated concussion within one year of initial injury than those who did not. So in this study, they basically showed that these individuals had not fully recovered physiologically. It's like, it's like saying, okay, you tear your hamstring and you're a wide receiver. And so once you feel well enough to go back into the game, start practicing again, running full speed, you go in and start doing that. 
versus that's one model. So you're asymptomatic. But another model would be let's get an MRI on the hamstring and make sure that hamstring is fully healed before we have you start running full speed. Or if you had an ACL repair, let's make sure that ACL is really solid. This is the model that they're starting to propose for concussions and return to play. And I think this is really great because they showed that even though these individuals were asymptomatic, 11 of the 82, they were asymptomatic, they still had abnormalities on their brain MRI from a diffusion tensor imaging standpoint. And when they returned, they were the ones who were significantly more likely to sustain a repeated concussion. So that's really important. Uh, and that's basically summarizing what I just said. Now, this is a fantastic study looking at a large segment of our military veterans who were exposed to blast injuries versus controls who weren't exposed to blast injuries, basically. So they looked at them not only at one year after their injuries, but they looked at them at five years after their injuries after their injuries. And just to, to pause there, you know, rewind 15 years. 15 years ago, the literature on concussions was pretty scant. And it seems that with one major professional organization and there was, uh, you know, athletes coming out saying, professional athletic organization, athletes coming out saying they were having residual symptoms after playing this sport led to a lot more research in the world of neurology regarding head injuries, mild traumatic brain injuries, and their chronic effects. As I say in almost every concussion video I do, concussions are a perplexing phenomenon for neurologists because neurologists see the worst of the worst. They see people who come into the emergency room with their skull fracture. They see people who have had horrible brain bleeds after falling off a ladder. They see these demonstrable effects of head injuries. And then they also see individuals who have a concussion where there's no skull fracture, there's no hemorrhage, there's no subdural hematoma, and their life is ruined. And so that led a lot of neurologists to basically laughing off the effects of subconcussive head impacts, laughing off the effects of concussions, which, though that was the prevailing opinion, with the reports of all these retired professional athletes saying, hey, I'm not normal, and we've you know, watched the movie Concussion, you can see some of the really dramatic examples, that's prompted scientists to now start studying in detail what's going on. So this study is so cool because we're looking at one year after the injury and five years after the injury. So again, like I said, around 2005 is maybe when all this started to change. I even know I went to a, a major neurology convention uh, somewhere around 2012, 2013. And uh, even then they're, they're, list for diagnosing concussions was one of the symptoms was do you look glassy eyed you know and i was thinking at that time i'm like gosh you know we should have better biomarkers than just does somebody look glassy eyed to diagnose a concussion and now we do so here one in five year outcomes and they're looking at like i said combat deployed controls without blast exposure concussive blast patients combat concussion arising not from blast exposure, combat deployed controls with blast exposure history. So they have all these different groups and they're comparing, you know, somebody who was exposed to blast but didn't have concussion, somebody who was exposed to blast and had concussion, somebody who had concussions not from blast, and they have all this information and they're doing diffusion tensor imaging studies. And they basically showed the diffusion tensor imaging abnormalities were observed to have varying trajectories, most striking was the fractional anisotropy U-shaped curve. So all you need to know there is that's an abnormality on DTI. So fractional and anisotropy U-shaped curve observed for a proportion of for, for a proportion of those that if we had only followed them to one year would look like trajectories of recovery. However, by continuing the follow-up to five years in these very same patients, a secondary increase in the number of reduced fractional anisotropy regions was identified. So that's really important. So they said if we'd only followed these people to one year, we would have concluded that they were basically they'd recovered. 
But then following these individuals to five years, they saw the secondary increase identified in patients with blast concussion may be the earliest indications of microstructural changes underlying the accelerated brain aging theory recently reported from chronic cross-sectional studies of veterans following brain injury. These varying trajectories also inform potential prognostic neuroimaging markers, biomarkers for progression and recovery. This is huge. Again, this is the study Brain Communications 2019. Everything I'm presenting today is like brand new. There's 334 articles on concussion and diffusion tensor imaging. If you look them up, I went through the 30 most recent last night. This is really, really significant for anybody you know who's in the military, who's been exposed to concussions and they're being told, you know, you're normal, you look normal, and they have post-traumatic stress dis disorder or something of that nature, they have depression or they have dizziness. This is showing that they're not normal. And particularly if you study them for five years, we start to see the changes in the brain. And that's so consistent with what these other professional athletes were reporting. It was years down the line that they're starting to have all of these you know, symptoms of dementia or symptoms of emotional dysregulation. And this is huge. So now if we start to couple, I'll just show you. So this is what diffusion tensor imaging can also look like. So we're looking at the white matter track, so to speak. So now you start to couple diffusion tensor imaging with, I talked about volumetric MRI, where we actually start to see the emotional processing area of the brain through here. It's called the limbic system, limbic system means it's around the corpus callosum. This is where a lot of the white matter tract injury is thought to be, potentially because your corpus callosum is the connecting structure of both hemispheres of your brain. So if you have a shearing injury, lots of times your corpus callosum, this white matter tract is gonna take some stretching forces. They also see stretching forces in the brainstem here. They see other stretching forces down here at the base of the brainstem called the cerebellar peduncles. So now we start to see the stretching forces affecting these areas, which is super interesting. So now we're seeing that this invisible injury is becoming visible. And we're also seeing that these effects may not be immediate. Maybe after a year, somebody looks like they're recovered and five years later, they're dramatically different. And, and that's one example. And then I also cited other examples where maybe someone feels asymptomatic and they're ready to go back in the game, but their diffusion tensor imaging shows they're really not ready to go back into the game. If they go back in the game, they're more likely to get a second concussion. Okay, let me see here. This is just basically another study saying the same thing. Longitude of white matter abnormalities and sport related concussion. Um, this is a great, great study. Um, again, Basically, the white matter of concussed athletes had elevated mean, diffusiv mean diffusivity at the asymptomatic point and out to six months after injury. So we're seeing, again, that even if you feel asymptomatic, you might still have an issue. This is a great study because it's, hopefully everybody's with me. There's also one other modality called, well, there's many other modalities. Um, this modality I'm going to talk about now is called MR spectroscopy, where we can look at inflammatory mediators in the brain. When I did the talk on gluten and ataxia or gluten imbalance, I talked about how individuals who have gluten-related disorders where they don't have celiac disease, but they react to gluten, they can track all this inflammation around the cerebellum using MR spectroscopy. So in this study, Neuroimage Clinical 2020, brand new, Basically, they looked at diffusion tensor imaging along with these inflammatory mediators. And they found, and these are the cool studies, or the cool pictures of it. You can go back and read it if you want. They found these findings suggest that differing INS, is inositol levels, among concussed athletes are associated with alterations in tissue microstructure and brain function during the course of concussion recovery. So the tissue microstructure they looked at was diffusion tensor imaging. So now we're able to correlate a microstructural brain MRI, which I'm calling the brain MRI for concussion, with other types of brain MRI, looking at inflammation, showing, hey, there's still inflammation here. Hey, your axons are still damaged. 
And then this is another one looking at neurofilament light chain protein in former athletes. Here they took, uh, these are former NFL athletes, or excuse me, they're, I, I think they're, they were football players, um, professional contact sport athletes, excuse me, so not necessarily football, professional contact sport athletes. And they looked at the concentrations of neurofilament light chain protein, which is one of the brain proteins I was talking about. I've talked about GFAP, I've talked about tau, I've talked about uh, S100B. So they looked at how much of this brain protein was in the blood along with the, the diffusion tensor imaging findings. And they found that in this X pro group, and neurofilament light chain proteins were positively correlated with mean diffusivity of the corpus callosum and fornix and total ventricular volume. So we're seeing how these different proteins in the blood as well as, you know, on MR spectroscopy correlate with persistent findings on diffusion tensor imaging. So again, diffusion tensor imaging is different from your standard brain MRI. It's looking at the microstructure. It's looking at the axons, the wires, so to speak, of your neurons. It looks to see if they're stretched, if they're swollen, if they have less myelin. Basically, that's what you can tell from diffusion tensor imaging. And it's so cool because now we can make the invisible injury visible. And let me just go over to Facebook and see if there's any questions. And it looks like... Good morning to everyone and have a wonderful weekend and I hope this was informative and yeah and we'll go from there so have a great day everyone and send me any questions and I'll talk to you soon